Okay, we'd like uh, to start on time since the room is full. Um, I should acknowledge that there are at least two physicists in the audience, which uh, is an unusual occurrence here <laughs> at the we CFA, and uh, we credit Laura for that. <laughs> uh, so a few words about Laura. Uh, she arrived here um, three years ago, in a few months, three years and a few months. Uh, she did her uh, undergraduate studies at Yale University, uh, and finished in 2011, and then uh, got her PhD from the University of Chicago in 2016. Uh, she became an ITC fellow, and uh, at the same time junior fellow at the Society of Fellows uh, for three years, uh, and uh, then she became a Clay Fellow here, and uh, she accepted an assistant professorship at Leiden University starting next year. Uh, which we hope <laughs> will not come to fruition. Um, a few words about uh, awards that she received. Um, uh, she received many awards, so I'll mention just a few. Uh, she received the Beckwith Prize for Excellence in Astronomy at Yale University, and then the NSF uh, Graduate Fellowship, uh, the Harvard Dissertation Fellowship at Chicago, the Hubble and Sagan Postdoc Fellowship. She basically received all uh, <laughs> prize fellowships uh, for postdocs. Uh, she received the IAU uh, PhD prize and the PH. Uh, she was the PH lecturer here at the CFA. Um, I should say that you know when looking at, at her publications, early on she actually worked on black holes. Or maybe you might find that uh, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she worked on cataclysmic variables, uh, accretion disk. And actually, the reason I, I knew that is because one of her papers is, is very well cited in the LIGO era about um, the mass gap, uh, right? And you remember that? A very uh, important paper that people are discussing whether there is a mass gap in the mass distribution of black holes. Uh, and during her PhD, she discovered water in the atmosphere of uh, the hot Jupiter wasp. 43b, uh, which is uh, 260 light years away. Uh, that was a major discovery. Uh, I should say that when she arrived here, the first day that she arrived to the ITC corridor, I saw Laura and I asked her, what are you working on? And we went to my office and then within uh, a few minutes, we came up with an interesting collaborative project and, and Laura sort of took off and, and produced a paper that uh, got a lot of attention after that and that demonstrated to me that not only that she's an exceptional observer but also a theorist in, 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 in spirit and she can do anything. <laughs> she, can, she can do anything. Um, this was about Proxima B and whether it has an atmosphere and JWST promises to tell us perhaps that. So without further ado, Laura. Thank you, Avi. All right, my ears are burning here. <laughs> um, OK, so thank you all for coming. It's, it's great to see so many friendly faces in the audience. Um, I, I'll be talking today about the characterization of exoplanet atmospheres. Um, and I know many of you are very familiar with exoplanets, but just a very brief history. Uh, the first planet beyond the solar system was discovered in 1995. Um, and if you fast forward to today, we now know of over 4,000 exoplanets, um, with many more coming in the next decade or so from a lot of surveys that are ongoing and scheduled to launch. So this is showing the number of planets discovered every year. And this is not cumulative, right? This is the number of planets every year. So you can see how fast the field has grown. Um, and if you take that information and you, and you synthesize it into the the key pieces of science that we want to know, um, based on the planets that have been discovered, we know that planets actually outnumber stars in the galaxy, um, and that small planets are more common than big planets. And all of this led very excitingly to the award of a Nobel Prize for the discovery of the first planets just a couple of weeks ago. OK, so now you're all experts in exoplanets. Um, oh. And, and I should also say, the planets that we have discovered are far more diverse than the planets of the solar system. So this is a plot showing 
uh, planet mass as a function of distance from the host star. Different color points correspond to different detection techniques. Thank you. Um, and the solar system planets are marked in black. And there's a lot of selection effects that go into this plot. This is just showing pure detection, so bigger planets are easier to find. Um, but the things that I want to highlight are that we have seen all kinds of planets that are totally different from anything we imagined based on the architecture of our own solar system. So we've seen planets that are very hot with short orbital periods, some shorter than 24 hours. We've also discovered a new population of planets intermediate in size between Earth and Neptune, and it is a raging debate right now whether we call these things super-Earths or mini-Neptunes. So you can always tell it's exciting science when people are arguing. Um, we've seen very massive planets, and a whole bunch of oddball things. We've seen planets with very high eccentricities, planets orbiting white dwarfs, planets that are so hot that their surfaces are most likely molten lava, etc., etc. And, of course, there's a whole region of this parameter space that we have not yet fully explored, which covers, notably, all of the planets in the solar system. So now that we have found all of these planets, the, the next step is to characterize their atmospheres. We can use the atmosphere as a tool to understand how the planets form, how they evolve, what they are currently like. So we see planets in very exotic environments, very highly irradiated on one side, cold on the other. What does that do to their climates, to their weather? And ultimately, we hope to use the atmospheres of exoplanets to answer the question, <coughs> is there life on any of these planets? So a very brief primer of how this works. I remember when I started graduate school, I thought there was no way we could learn about the atmospheres of exoplanets and I've been proving myself wrong ever since. Um, so one of the ways we can do this is by observing a planet <coughs> transiting its host star, so passing in front of the star. And when this happens, the, a little bit of the starlight will filter through the planet's atmosphere, and it can get absorbed and scattered by molecules with a wavelength dependent. So at wavelengths where the atmosphere is more opaque, the planet looks a little bit bigger. And likewise, when the planet goes behind the star, the thermal emission and reflection are blocked. And so by measuring the change in brightness over time, you can infer what portion of the sum total light came from the planet. And these techniques are sensitive to what the atmosphere is made out of, its chemical composition, its temperature structure, also whether clouds or haze are present. Uh, and to make this a little closer to home, here's a picture of the Earth from space. Uh, in the optical, you can see the beautiful blue Rayleigh scattering. <coughs> if you move into the infrared, that Rayleigh scattering is gone. But then if you move into the ozone band at 9.6 microns, you can see that the Earth is a little bit bigger. See that? And so this is what we hope to detect for exoplanets. The second technique that I use a lot in my work is thermal phase curve observations, and I have a movie to explain this. Uh, so the idea here is that for a planet on a short period orbit, it's expected to be tidally locked to its host star. And so as it orbits around, you see different faces of the planet in turn. And so here we see the hot day side of the planet rotating into view. Now it's eclipsed, and that gives you a baseline measurement of the star by itself. And so every um, change in brightness relative to that baseline is due to the changing viewing angle of the planet. And so this gives us the chemical composition of the planet as a function of longitude, and it also tells us a lot about the planet's climate. And I should note, we don't actually see the planet going around. They're too close to their host stars on the sky to spatially resolve. And so all of this is inferred from a point source that then we can disentangle by observing a time series of brightness. So I gave a talk on this recently, and someone at the end said, this, you make this look so easy. And I thought that was really funny, because it's not easy at all. Um, and so I have just one slide to illustrate part of why this is such a hard measurement to make. Um, so this is one of the very first 
thermal phase curve observations made with the Spitzer Space Telescope. Um, and the raw data is shown in the top panel. You can see some stuff, you know, this big drop here is the transit, but there's all this wiggly stuff. After you correct for systematics, after you spend many, many months of grad student time, you can get to something like this. And just the, the scale here, so this is a tenth of a percent, which is about your best case scenario for how big your atmospheric features will be. Um, and by contrast, the instrument systematic noise is about one percent of scale, so it's at least an order of magnitude larger, and it's, as you push to smaller and cooler planets, that can become two or three orders of magnitude. So it's a very technically challenging measurement. And it's also very challenging from a theoretical perspective. And so we are trying to interpret fairly low signal to noise um, spectra of these planets, but we know that there's all kinds of stuff happening in the atmosphere. So there's cloud formation happening on microphysical <coughs> distance scales. There's atmospheric circulation that is operating on planet-wide scales. And so from a, a modeling standpoint, we really draw on expertise from you know, 1D to 3D models. There's no way to put all of this physics into a single model. And so something that I've, I've been pushing hard on in, in my work is collaboration with theorists to make sure that we're putting in the physics and chemistry that we need to interpret the data that we get. Okay, so I wanna go through a couple of frontier topics that I am really proud to have worked on in the last couple of years. And one of them is using the atmospheric composition of a planet as a fossil record for its formation condition. 